welcome to Story Station, episode 27. In this episode, you can listen to three Asian stories. The first story is titled, The Lost Camel, from India. These four bright young men use small and minuscule details on the road to accurately describe a camel that they had never seen. The second story is titled, The Fire Quest, from Japan. Listen to this story, finally explaining why so many insects are attracted to the light of a flame, even when they see it's dangerous. Third story is titled, The Three Rhymesters, from China. This story shows that women can be just as smart, and maybe smarter than men. Hope you enjoy it! I will read an Indian story called, The Lost Camel. There is a city called Alakapuri, famous for all the riches that sea and land can yield, and inhabited by people speaking different languages. In that city reigned a king named Alakesha, who was a storehouse of all excellent qualities. He was so just a king that during his reign, the cow and the tiger amicably quenched their thirst side by side in the same pond. The cats and the rats sported in one and the same spot, and the kite and the parrot laid their eggs in the same nest, as though they were birds of a feather. The women never deviated from the path of virtue, and regarded their husbands as gods. Timely rain ref- refreshed the soil, and all Alakesha's subjects lived in plenty and happiness. In short, Alakesha was the body, and his subjects the soul of that body, for he was upright in all things. Now there was in Alakapuri a rich merchant who lost a camel one day. He searched for it without success in all directions, and at last reached a road which he was informed led to another city called Mathurapuri the king of which was named Matharesha. He had under under him four excellent ministers, whose names were Podhaditya, Podhachandra, Podhavyapaka, and Podhavibishana. These four ministers, being for some reason displeased with the king, quitted his dominions and set out for another country. As they journeyed along, They observed the track of a camel, and each made a remark on the peculiar condition of an animal. Judging from the footsteps and other indications on the road, presently they met the merchant who was searching for his camel, and entering into conversation with him, one of the travelers inquired if the animal was not lame in one of its legs. Another asked if it was not blind of the right eye. The third asked if asked if its tail was not unusually short, and the fourth inquired if it was not suffering from colic. They were all answered in the affirmative by the merchant, who was convinced that they must have seen the animal, and eagerly demanded where they had seen it. They replied that they had seen traces of the camel, but not the camel itself, which being inconsistent with the minute description they had given of it. The merchant accused them of having stolen the beast, and immediately applied to King Alakesha for redress. On hearing the merchant's story, the king was equally impressed with the belief that the travelers must know what had become of the camel, and sending for them, threatened them with his displeasure if they did not convince the tr- confess the truth. How could they know, he demanded? that the camel was lame or blind, or whether the tail was long or short, or that it was suffering from any malady, unless they had it in their possession. In reply, they each explained the reasons which had induced them to express their belief in these particulars. The first traveler said, I noticed in the footmarks of the animal that one was deficient, and I concluded accordingly that it was lame of one of its legs. The second said, I noticed that the leaves of the trees 
on the left side of the road had been snapped or torn off, whilst those on the right side were untouched. Once I concluded that the animal was blind of its right eye. The third said, I saw some drops of blood on the road, which I had conjectured had flowed from the bites of gnats or flies, and thence concluded that the camel's tail was shorter than usual, in consequence of which he could not brush the insects away. The fourth said, I observed that while the forefeet of the animal were planted firmly on the ground, the hind ones appeared to have scarcely touched it. Once I guessed that they were contracted by pain in the belly of the animal. When the king heard their explanation, he was much struck by the sagacity of the travelers, and giving five hundred pagodas to the merchant who had lost the camel, he made the four young men his principal ministers, and bestowed on the, each of them several villages as free gifts. The End I hope you enjoyed this story. The next story begins in a moment. I'll read a Japanese story called The Fire Quest. The wise poet sat reading by the light of his taper. It was a night of the seventh month. The cicala sang in the flower of the pomegranate. The frog sang by the pond. The moon was out and all the stars. The air was heavy and sweet scented. But the poet was not happy, for moths came by the score to, to the light of his taper. Not moths only, but cockshapers and dragonflies with their wings rainbow tinted. One and all, they came upon the fire quest, and one and all, they burned their bright wings in the flame, and so died and the poet was grieved. Little harmless children of the night, he said, why will you still fly upon the fire quest? Never, never can you attain, yet you strive and you die. Foolish ones, have you never heard the story of the firefly queen? The moths and the cockchafers and the dragonflies fluttered about the taper and paid him no heed. They have never heard it, said the poet, yet it is old enough. Listen. The firefly queen was the brightest and most beautiful of small things that fly. She dwelt in the heart of a rosy lotus. The lotus grew on a still lake, and it swayed to and fro upon the lake's bosom, while the firefly queen slept within. It was like the reflection of a star in the water. You must know, O oh, little children of the night, that the firefly queen had many suitors. Moths and cockshakers and dragonflies innumerable flew to the lotus on the lake, and their hearts were filled with passionate love. Have pity, have pity, they cried, queen of fireflies, bright light of the lake. But the firefly queen sat and smiled and shone. It seemed that she was not sensible of the incense of love that rose about her. At last, she said, O oh, you lovers, one and all, what make you here idly, cumbering my lotus house? Prove your love, if you love me indeed. Go, you lovers, and bring me fire, and then I will answer. Then, O oh, little children of the night, there was a swift whir of wings. For the moths and the cockchafers and the dragonflies innumerably swiftly departed upon the fire quest. The firefly queen laughed. Afterwards, I'll tell you the reason of her laughter. So the lovers flew here and there in the still night, taking with them their desire. They found lighted lattices ajar and entered forthwith. In one chamber, there was a girl who took a love letter from her pillow and read in tears by the light of a taper. In another, a woman sat holding the light close to her mirror, which, where she looked and painted her face. A great white moth put out the trembling candle flame with his wings. Alack, I am afraid, shrieked the woman. 
the horrible dark. In another place, there lay a man dying. He said, For pity's sake, light me the lamp, for the black night falls. We had lighted it, they said, long since. It is close behind you, and a legion of moths and dragonflies flutter about it. But I cannot see anything at all, murmured the man. But those that flew on the fire quest burnt their frail wings in the fire. In the morning, they lay dead by the hundred and were swept away and forgotten. The firefly queen was safe in her lotus bower with her beloved, who was as bright as she, for he was a great lord of the fireflies. No need had he to go upon the fire quest. He carried the living flame beneath his wings. Thus the firefly queen deceived her lovers, and therefore she laughed when she sent them from her on a vain adventure. Be not deceived, cried the wise poet, O oh, little children of the night. The firefly queen is always the same. Give over the fire quest. But the moths and the cockchafers and the dragonflies paid no heed to the words of the wise poet. Still, they fluttered about his taper, and they burnt their bright wings in the flame, and so died. Presently, the poet blew out the light. I must needs sit in the dark, he said. It is the only way. The End I hope you enjoyed this story. The next story begins in a moment. I will read a Chinese story called the three rhymesters. Once there were three daughters in a family. The oldest one married a physician, the second one married a magistrate, but the third, who was more than unusually intelligent and a clever talker, married a farmer. Now it chanced, once upon a time, that their parents were celebrating a birthday. So the three daughters came together with their husbands wished them long life and happiness. Parents-in-law prepared a meal for their three sons-in-law and put the birthday wine on the table. But the oldest son-in-law, who knew that the third one had not attended school, wanted to embarrass him. It is far too tiresome, said he, just to sit here drinking. Let's have a drinking game. Each one of us must invent a verse, one that rhymes and makes sense on the words, in the sky, on the earth, at the table, in the room. And whoever cannot do so must empty the three glasses as punishment. All the company were satisfied. Only this third son-in-law felt embarrassed and insisted on leaving. But the guests would not let him go and obliged him to keep his seat. Then the oldest son-in-law son began. I will make a start with my verse. Here it is. In the sky, the phoenix proudly flies. On the earth, the lamb can tamely lies. At the table, through an ancient book I weighed. In the room, I softly called the maid. The second son-in-law continued, and I say, In the sky, the turtle dove flies round. On the earth, the ox paws up the ground. At the table, one studies the deeds of yore. In the room, the maid she sweeps up, sweeps up the floor. But the third son-in-law stuttered and found nothing to say. And when all of them insisted, he broke out in rough tones of voice. In the sky flies a leaden bullet. On the earth stalks a tiger beast. On the table, lies a pair of scissors. In the room, I call the stable boy. The other two sons-in-laws clapped their hands and began to laugh loudly. Why, the four lines don't rhyme at all, said they. And besides, they don't make sense. A leaden bullet is no bird. The stable boy does his work outside. Would you call him into the room? Nonsense, nonsense. Drink! Yet before they had finished speaking, 
The third daughter raised the curtain of the woman's room and stepped out. She was angry, yet she could not suppress a smile. How so do our lines not make sense, said she. Listen a moment and I'll explain them to you. In the sky, our leaden bullet will shoot your phoenix and your turtle dove. On the earth, our tiger beast will devour your sheep and your ox. On the table, our pair of scissors will cut up all your old books. And finally, in the room, well, the stable boy can marry your maid. Then this oldest son-in-law said, Well said, sister-in-law, you know how to talk. If you were a man, you would have had your degree long ago. And as a punishment, we will empty our three glasses. The end. I hope you liked this story. Thank you for listening to Story Station. We are adding stories as frequently as possible, so check back often. We would love to hear your feedback and any questions you may have. Thank you.